Okay. Um, the fact that his soul was not stained with sin. All right. Now, all that I said before hasn't been recorded, so I've got to say it all over again and bring us up to date, okay? All right. The most important thing with Jesus is that his body was flawless, not because he was a perfect, beautiful specimen of humankind, but because his soul had not sinned. Now, we've talked about how that man can't keep that law perfectly, and we will not be sinless before God. The Apostle Paul goes so far as to say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, that all are sinners, but that does not include Jesus, does it? What's amazing to me is that he was tempted in all points like you and I are. Lord, it's not fair. I was tempted beyond what I could bear. Scripture says you're not tempted beyond what you can bear. In fact, I'll go you one more. You're tempted, and I will make sure that you have a way of escape. How many of you have taken the way of escape every time and thus have never sinned? How many of you have looked at the way of escape and says, no, that's not what I want. Now you can raise your hand. Yeah, that's the one I took. No, that that little way of escape is not for me. Jesus always did the right thing. So that's not human. Yeah, it is. That's what Jesus proved. It could be done. Do you know how important it was for him to be flawless when he went to the cross? It was everything. That's right. It was everything. What are we reminding ourselves of when we partake of the body and blood of Jesus? We're reminding ourselves of what Jesus did on our behalf. For our sake, if you will. He lived this flawless life so that he could be that lamb that takes away the sin of the world. He lived that flawless life so he could go up on that cross, shed his blood for our sins. And he did. And we're asked to remember that on a regular basis with the body and blood of Jesus in a symbolic form, which we call the Lord's Supper, or sometimes we call it communion. It's a reference back to the last supper of Jesus with his disciples, in which he broke the bread and gave it to him, says, take, eat, this is my body. The last supper, when he took the cup and says, this is the blood of my covenant that takes away the sins of the world. It's been shed for the remission of your sins. Take it and all of you drink of it. Did you notice that some of the translations in that actually say, take it and, and drink all of it? Some have taken that so literally they said, well, we've got to make sure the cup's empty when we get through. No, that's not the point, is it? The point's not whether the cup is empty or not. The point's whether we have taken the blood of Jesus into our lives or not. Now, as a sidelight to this, there was also an accusation that was made. The pagan Gentile world, at the time of the early church, heard the disciples talking about eating the body and drinking the blood of their Savior, their God, Jesus Christ. Now, if you didn't know what they were talking about, what what would be your presumption? What would be your first thought? Cannibalistic rituals. Yeah. Cannibal rituals. By the way, how many of you in here have a cannibal ritual in the church as a Christian? You don't? Well, then you're not doing it right, are you? No, we don't actually literally eat the body of Christ, do we? It's symbolic. Without getting too technical in the grammar, because I've forgotten it all, But this is my body holding up a wafer is not a literalization of that wafer becoming the body of Christ or even as one alternative doctrine says, hiding it on the back side of that wafer is the literal body of Christ. No, it's a spiritual act that's going on. It's a spiritual spiritual connection between the unleavened bread and our spiritual lives. It is a spiritual connection with the contents of the cup. This cup is the blood of my covenant. Now that one's a very specific figure of speech where we refer to the holder when we really are meaning what's inside of it. 
It's not the cup at all. So somebody who says, well, you can only have one cup. Well, they're missing the point, aren't they? It is the contents of the cup that is the blood of the covenant that was shed for our remission of our sins. It is not the cup itself. It is what is inside of it. Does that mean that that grape juice has become literally the blood of Christ? No, it just means that it symbolizes the blood that Jesus shed for us. And when we eat that bread and drink that cup, we do it to commemorate his death until when? Until he comes again. Has he come again yet? So we're still eating it, aren't we? We're still drinking it. And we will continue to eat it and drink it until he comes again. Will we do so in a worthy manner? Uh, I had a bad thought this week, so I can't take the Lord's Supper. Um, I got mad at my, uh, my, my wife. I can't take the Lord's Supper. Um, I had a lustful thought this week. It's time for Haskell to, con- to confess, I guess, you know. It doesn't make any difference what it is, folks. That's not what he's talking about when he says in an unworthy manner. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Let's look at that just a little bit more closely and recognize what he's actually saying there. Let's start in verse 23 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. By the way, where did Paul receive his message concerning this Lord's Supper? Direct from God, direct revelation, that's right. He didn't get it from Peter. He didn't get it from James, the brother of Jesus. He didn't get it from the elders in Jerusalem or the other apostles. He got it directly from the Lord Jesus Christ. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now let's go back just a moment on that body which was broken. Was Jesus' body literally broken on the cross? No. He uses the phrase here through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so it's okay for us to use it today as long as we understand what it means. What it means is, for my sake, Christ suffered. That's what it means, isn't it? Everybody understands it. Everybody agrees, right? It means that he suffered for my sin, for my fault. My punishment was taken upon him. My iniquities were taken on him. That's what it means. But if somebody uses that, let's say they're up here at the Lord's Supper, and they say this is the body of Christ which is broken on our behalf, that's okay. It doesn't mean that it was literally broken, but rather that it was given for our benefit. Let's go back to that then, verse 24. Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Why do we partake of the Lord's Supper? To remember him. Don't we have enough remembrances already? Don't we wear crosses to remind ourselves of him? Don't we do things to remind ourselves of him? Don't we carry our Bibles around in public so people will know that we're remembering him? Don't we put little stickers on the backs of our car? So people will know that we're remembering him? No. Is there anything wrong with those things? Probably not. Does it matter though? Only if we give it credibility and power. But you know what really matters is whether we remember him or not. Now what is it we remember him as? Well, I like to remember him as a baby. How about you? That's my preference. Remembering him as a baby. Babies are harmless, aren't they? They're sweet. They're full of promise. And oh, God made him look so sweet so we wouldn't kill him, I guess. I don't know. But they're so precious. Can I just remember Jesus as a baby? No, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is the gospel message. And in fact, I don't remember any scripture that says it's the birth of Jesus that is the gospel message. Although it does say, quoting from the Old Testament prophecies, Glad tidings of good things have come. There is good news that came when the baby was born, but it was because of the promise of what he would end up doing. And what he would end up doing is what we remember here at the Lord's table. And remembering that at the Lord's table is really what he says here. Take, eat, this is my body. 
Now, when we talk about this is my body again, remember this is a liter literal language, but it's a figurative phrase. It is specific language, but it is a figurative phrase. If we look at the science of it alone, we know it's not literal. Somebody says, well, the Bible is literal in everything it does. And I said, then you're an idiot. Can I use that word in public? Yeah. I would have used the word stupid, but Jim called me down for that the other day and said, you can't do that in public. I said, okay. So you're an idiot. Why? Because you're not discerning what it says. Language is really not that hard to understand. And we have to use common sense with it. You know what the problem with common sense is, right? Not very common. That's right. The problem we have is we'll look at this and we'll say, well, this is my body. It means it literally has to be the body of Christ, right? No. It never was intended, even when he said it this way, that it was a literal body of Christ issue, but rather a symbolic body of Christ issue. This is my body. And what's the issue of it? It was broken for you. It wasn't just that it was broken. A lot of bodies have been broken, haven't they? A lot of people have died, haven't they? But this one died for you. And then verse 25, in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying this, this cup is the new covenant of my blood, or in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. This cup is the co new covenant of my blood. Again, the literalness of it. It's a very specific, hard statement of fact. Is it literally the new covenant of his blood? No. The blood itself was what made that new covenant, wasn't it? The blood itself of Jesus when he was crucified on the cross, the blood that covered his face from the thorns that were stuck into his, his brow, the whip marks on the back that were bleeding and, and bleeding out, the nails that bled from his hands, from his feet, the spear that went into his side after he was dead. And how do we know that? Because when the fluid came out, it wasn't blood, just blood anymore. It was blood and water mixed. Why? Because the red platelets settle when the body stops moving, when the blood stops flowing in the body. When the person dies, it separates. His blood was shed. Why? For you. For me. For my sins. The new covenant was then established. And when we go to the Lord's table, we remember that, don't we? Don't you? Okay. And he says, if you don't remember that, then what's the problem? How about this, verse 26? For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until when? Until he comes. I thought we were supposed to proclaim the resurrection. Well, yeah, but you know, in order to be resurrected, you have to first what? You have to first die. Jesus died for our sins, was buried, according to the scriptures, and was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This gospel which I received, that he delivered unto them. That gospel that we have received, that we deliver unto each other and to the world around us as well. Verse 27, uh, therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself. So let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Do you know what they were actually doing in the Corinthian church? It's kind of sad, really. They would get together and they'd have a potluck, except it wasn't a potluck, it was a picnic. I brought my food, you brought your food, we didn't share. And the Lord's Supper, just as it had been in the Passover meal, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and said, this is my body, passed it around to them. And they apparently did that in the course of the Corinthian church, doing it as well. And just as Jesus, after the supper, took the cup, said, this is the blood of my covenant, and passed it around, all of you drink from it. Apparently, that's what they were doing in the Corinthian church as well. 
The problem is you had some that had money and some that didn't. My goodness, that sounds like us, doesn't it? Some that have plenty and some that don't have much or not enough. Some that are filled to plenty or overflowing, don't look at me that way, and some that aren't. Some that are skinny, that are hungry, that are not filled with food and drink. And they weren't sharing with each other. They were having this feast, if you will, of excess on the part of some, while others basically didn't have enough to take care of it. And they were doing that and saying, we're celebrating the Lord's death till he comes. We're remembering the Lord until he comes again. That appears to be the circumstance of what they were doing in Corinth. So he says, wait a minute. You eat and drink in an unworthy manner. What is he talking about? Well, you're eating for food. We're not here to eat food. We're here to what? Remember the Lord's death until he comes. In an irreverent manner. Good. Unworthy manner is the way some translate it. Irreverent manner might be another way to put it. However, reverence in our modern times, we tend to think that means bowed heads, quiet, no interruptions. If the kid cries, that mama's in trouble because she should have had him out in the cry room before that ever happened. Your cell phone goes off, we're going to throw it against the wall. Now, by the way, I think that is scriptural, by the way. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Sleep is a euphemism for death. If we would just judge ourselves, we would not be judged. If we would just judge ourselves, if we would just take care of our own business first, then God wouldn't have to judge us in this manner. There's an implication of the body judging as well during this case, of the church judging each other trying to take care of business in that regard as well. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord that we may not be condemned with the world. God does chasten us if we're not doing the right thing, doesn't he? To try and help us to correct our attitude, correct our behavior, correct our situation, if you will. And by the way, this is another one of those sideways verses that if we are aware of how it says this here, and tie it in with a lot of the others, we realize he's telling us we can lose our salvation, can't we? Now, by the way, that's not going to be on the test at the pearly gates. I don't think that's going to keep you out of heaven if you disagree with me on that. You can read this scripture and say, well, it doesn't say that. Okay, fine. Let's go on. I don't know what the warning means if it doesn't mean you can lose, can't lose or something. But nevertheless, therefore, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together for judgment. And the rest I'll set in order when I come. By the way, that last phrase there, uh, that's a threat. <laughs> Just want to make sure you remember that. He says, I am coming. And elsewhere he says, am I going to have to come with a big stick? Or am I instead going to be able to come in love? That depends on your behavior, doesn't it? And in the Lord's Supper, the Lord is telling us it depends on your behavior. Now, by the way, is the Lord's Supper a ritual that we keep? Yes, it is. Don't shy away from the word ritual just because it's been misused by some. There are some who would say, and this goes all the way back to Augustine, who said that they were sacraments of the church, particularly that of baptism and that of the Lord's Supper or the communion. Is it a sacrament of the church? Well, if you understand what they mean when they say sacrament, no. Is it sacred? Absolutely. The church doesn't actually dispense it though God does everybody with me on that God gives us the Lord's Supper God gives us baptism it's not the church that gives anything to the people it is God that does that somebody says well he does it through the church okay fine uh, I left my robes at home this morning um I get hot real easily, and even though it was cool this morning, I left him at home. Um, I'm not even wearing a ring. Boy, I should at least get a ring so you can kiss it occasionally. Anybody want to bow down to me? Boy, you guys are hard. 
Nobody wants to bow down to Haskell? No one. That's right. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> no one. Not even her. Thank you, dear. <laughs> don't you love it? <laughs> no, we don't believe that that's what happens. I'm no different than you. What does Paul says? We are just ministers. You say, well, yeah, you're a minister, though, and I'm not. No. He says we're all ministers. There is no distinction in that regard. And one of the things that we do is we come to the Lord's Supper and we're all together in this. I am unworthy of partaking of the Lord's Supper. But I am not partaking of it in an unworthy fashion. I discern the body of Christ when I partake of the Lord's Supper. I discern the blood of Jesus when I partake of the cup of righteousness. I am not worthy of it, but that's not what God says. He says, I'll show you mercy. I'll show you grace. And so sometimes you'll see Christians in tears as the Lord's Supper is participated in. They may have their Bibles open and be looking at the cross passages where he suffered and bled for my sins. And they may be absolutely in tears as they do so. And on the row at the other end, there's someone there with their hands raised in praise to God. Thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice of your son for my unworthy self. Both are right. Both are able to do the same thing and understand that in doing so, they're discerning the body and blood of Jesus. And it may be different in the way you understand it or the way you feel it. And by the way, we play down feelings so much in our churches that we sometimes forget that feelings are given by God. That doesn't mean that we have the Holy Spirit gigging us every once in a while to feel a certain something. But you know what? If I am saddened by the sacrifice of Jesus... That's God-given. Am I overjoyed because of the sacrifice of Jesus? That's also God-given. But if I do so in a manner unworthy, meaning that I do not discern the body and blood of Jesus, then I can suffer judgment. Friends, I don't want to suffer judgment. I want to discern the body and blood of Jesus. This, this kind of lesson I probably should have preached it before we did the communion this morning, but that's really not the point of it anyway. The point of it is, as Christians, we need to recognize this is not just something we kind of do and, and forget about it. This is not something we do on a regular basis so much that we forget the importance of it. It's not something we do and, and uh, okay, what's next? Uh, looks, um, do we have coloring crayons for the kids? No, we've got to pay attention, don't we? We've got to be involved. We've got to be in the now. In marriage counseling, sometimes we have to tell the, the couple that's involved, you know, if you just spent the moment together in the moment, in the present, not in the past, women, not in the future, guys, but in the now, for both of us. Some of you smile. You've been there before, haven't you? Yeah. Friends, that's all God asks of us. We are the bride of Christ, aren't we? And if we're the bride of Christ and we remember the sacrifice he made for us, and by the way, is he a dead groom? No, he's a living groom, isn't he? Jesus was resurrected from the dead. We remember his death, the sacrifice he made, but we're a living body of Jesus in the modern world. Friends, I could say a lot of other things, but really it doesn't matter. God said it better than I could say it anyway right in here. Spend time in his word. Spend time learning more about him. Spend time discerning the body of Jesus as you partake of the Lord's Supper each week. And by the way, on the each week, he says as often as you do this, he didn't say when to take it. But we see the early church taking it on the first day of the week and regularly taking it on the first day of the week. And that seems to be a pattern that was approved by the Holy Spirit and by God. And so we do so. But if you do so, pay attention to what you're doing. We're going to offer an invitation now, and if you need to come to God to set things right, won't you come now while we stand and while we sing?